I think most of us here know each other, but I'll say my name is Chuck Werweiler. I was the pastor here for another number of years, back to when Sarah was born. <laughs> pastor Frank would very much like to be here, but as um, sort of a double extra precaution in his life circumstance, he's staying. He's self quarantining, that's the word. And I think it's a good decision on his part, but he wants to be here. I'd like to begin our service um, with a prayer, and then I would ask that we just hold an attitude of prayer. Uh, after we pray, Kay will come up and play uh, an instrumental, and then um, Haley Savory will sing a song. And in all of this, from this point on, even for the whole service, we can be praying that God would come and minister to us himself. Because that is what we need. <clears throat> So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we need you by your spirit to reach into our heart of hearts. And nurture our wounded souls and rebirth joy and hope, kindle our memories of the grandness of our times with Josh and your abundance of great gifts that rain on us without ending. Amen.
Thank you, Kay and Haley. Let me give you an idea of what's going to unfold in the service. We're going to finish the service with uh, some music and pictures, a reading by George. We'll hear from a friend from Rwanda, Africa. Before that, You'll also have a chance to share some memories, and if you haven't filled out a memory card, we'll get one into your hand. Uh, the family, some members of the family will share some memories of Josh. I'll bring a message.
And um, we'll begin that time with Jared and Christiana singing with us. We'll sing a, a hymn together too eventually. Jared and Christiana have a history here at this church as well as at Dee and Dan's church. And uh, even though we're separated by a bit, as we should be, we're gathered together. Remember Josh. And wait before the Lord together. A few days ago, a few days ago, <clears throat> Sarah sent an email to Pastor Frank and I as we were preparing the service. It was to help us with that. And uh, I like so much what, how she introduced that letter. She said, I've been thinking a lot about what Josh went through and some of the songs, passages, concepts, and beliefs that he held on to. It's tough for me to understand what happened. A lot of people who feel like they cannot believe in God will say they do not understand why God lets people suffer. Now that Josh dies so tragically, I wish I had an answer for that, but I do not. Everybody here understands that question perfectly. And uh, we do not know the answer. You know, we hardly ever know the answer to why questions. Consider eliminating that word from your vocabulary about really important things. But God has given us, and there is really substantial things that we hold on to to live into that uh, enigma. And those things are, there really is 
suffering and sorrow. And there really is the goodness of God. And living realistically means taking both of those seriously. Every song you've heard sung is about that this evening so far. And as I, then Sarah went on in her email to describe how, um, oh, here's some uh, stories about Josh and some things he wrote and some things that happened. And as I reviewed those over and over again, I realized that Josh was giving us the answer we need. It's really, the things you sent me are quite profound, Sarah. I'm serious. Keep them. Josh, in fact, showed us the way. <clears throat> Josh showed us how to live and to die. He showed us how to engage the long defeat with purpose and hope. That phrase, the long defeat, was new to me. I've seen it before, but I didn't remember it. One of Josh's favorite bands is Thrice, and they sang the song, The Long Defeat, that we looked at just a couple of minutes ago. Here's some of those words again. And I, just, I just looked at these words. I like them so much. And just thinking of them, listening to you know, Josh with his headphones on, listening. The tyranny of deterioration. It worries me that it's all just a waste of time. Taking one step forward, two steps back. Still, I believe there's a thread through the thorns. Yeah, I believe that somewhere it's warm and I believe is ever bright beyond the black. The suffering that I see all around, it's enough to keep me crashing down till I lie wrecked and reeling from these falls. Still, I believe there's a word in the wire and I believe there's a way through the fire and I believe there's a joy that blooms beyond these walls. This should be the official song of that oncology center, you know what? <laughs> Honestly, every person in that building. So keep holding on to hope without assurance, holding on to memory of light. But will morning come? For all I know, we'll never see the sun, but together we'll fight the long defeat. Well, <clears throat> um, the fellow who wrote that song, a member of the group, Dustin Kensru, he got that phrase from J.R.R. Tolkien. It's part of the Lord of the Rings. And he says, that is, Kensru says, that the long defeat is an idea that Tolkien talked about a lot and wove through some of his stories. And it's essentially about believing that there's meaning to the good that you try to do and that you see in the world, even when a lot of things would conspire to make you believe, to not believe that that's good and true. Tolkien and his friend and colleague C.S. Lewis, we'll hear more from him later, had lived through horrible things in the course of two world wars. In fact, I would say they lived through things worse than probably anybody in this room has experienced. Just looking around, I'm guessing that's the case. They were convinced we live in a broken world in which a lot of sad things happen. Sometimes evil itself raises its ugly head. And all of that tragedy is never going to be eliminated because we live in a truly broken world. We fight the long defeat. We fight it because we have tasted not only the brokenness of this world, 
we have also tasted goodness that is the sweetness of life and draws us to the great goodness that is the heartbeat of the universe. Why, here's a why question. Why do we even know what good is? Because God, the author of life, is good. God's goodness is a light in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. People like Josh and you and me reach our best when we stand on that which is true and right and good, especially in the face of that which is horrible. That's worth fighting for, as Sam Gamgee once said. So back to Devin Kensrew. And he says, the phrase, the long defeat, expresses that we inevitably face our own death. But that this truth does not lead us to surrender or despair, but rather to fight the good fight. Nonetheless. So Sarah recalls. Some of Josh's friends were surprised when he died because he hadn't openly shared how bad the situation was. He wasn't in denial about it. He and I talked about the real possibility that he would die soon. But he had to always tell people what he was going to do next. He always had a plan for how he's going to keep fighting. When the oncologist, Sarah continues, when the oncologist said he might have only a few months to live, I was so broken. I could not stop crying. He told me, Sarah, doctors don't decide when it's time for me to die. Only God does. So let's not cry too much, he said, because he's given us today. We're still together today. I'm working on that let's not cry too much part. <laughs> oh, my. You know, every now and then Sarah says when she's feeling really badly, I just eat ice cream and cry, <laughs> which I just find a really big statement. I'm all over that one. I have other choices besides ice cream, but it's all the same. And then maybe all of you know this story, but we love it so much. So <clears throat> George was doing a project for school, and he came across a quote by Chuck Yeager, that test pilot from years ago, legend in his own time. Chuck Yeager said this, you do what you can for as long as you can. And when you finally can't, you do the next best thing. You back up, but you don't give up. George said, that sounds like my dad. <laughs> so Josh showed us how to live and to die. He showed us how to engage the long defeat with purpose and hope. Let me talk just a little bit about hope. Lamentations 3, 23 and 24. Josh liked that. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never end. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Now, the man who wrote those words 2,500 years ago was suffering more than any of us can imagine. As life as he knew it came to ruin around him, he wrote, My teeth grind on gravel. I am made to cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. And then just a few lines later, he wrote, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never end. Honestly, can we hold these two things at the same time? 
the brokenness of this world that yields so many tears and the steadfast love of God? Well, actually, we can. And we must because those are the two great realities of life. Those are them. We won't likely know ever some great reason for Josh's death, when or why or how. And there will never be a substitute for Josh in your heart. You'll always have this Josh-shaped hole. And at the same time, God's goodness remains. You will see it. You can count on this. His daily mercies will give you the strength to breathe. You know what it is to be so deeply sad. You just don't know. His daily mercies give you the strength to breathe. And his mercies will show you that you're not alone. Because you're not. God's steadfast love will be there and give you real hope in the midst of a real disaster. Sarah remembers. Josh wrote out the words to the entire hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. That's, that hymn is based on the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. He wrote it out by hand and posted it in our kitchen. He once texted me after we got more bad news. I just know that everything's going to be all right. I know that God is able to heal me. I don't know if he will, but just knowing that he can is all I need. He writes, God is so good, Sarah. Where did he get this stuff? You can live your life on this, Sarah, and the rest of us. Josh showed us the way to live hopefully as he engaged the long defeat. And, and he did so purposely. You know, it's kind of interesting as I was working this out, you, hope and purpose seemed distinct from one another, but I think they're inseparable. I think in talking about hope, I'm talking about purpose and vice versa. The darkness in life is real and really hard. Living purposely is not giving in to the darkness, but living into the greatest good of loving God and each other. And when that happens, the kingdom of God comes to earth. And here it is. We saw that happen in Josh. We were in the room with Josh where a storyline was unfolding that we didn't want. And Josh was fully engaged in loving God and us, and the kingdom of God was at hand. Living purposefully is living this life knowing that it is the leading edge for living life in God that begins now and is not and cannot be defeated by death. Josh showed us the way. So Sarah remembers, there's a church downtown that has this inscription across the front. The eternal God is thy refuge. She writes, once after we left the oncologist with bad news, who knows which time, Josh saw that. And he read it to me and said, it's really true, even when we don't feel that. Eternal God is thy refuge. He took a picture of it. And that was his phone background until he died. Death is bigger than we are. We need help <laughs> that only God can give, only. And God has reached out to us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believed in him would not perish.
but have eternal life. God comes to us in love. God puts on flesh and blood and is born of a woman, a human birth, Jesus. He showed us what it is to live the beautiful life of love and God and people right here in the midst of our broken world. Josh grasped enough of that that we saw the same in him. And in the person of Jesus, God has offered us something that only God can do, life reborn, that God does not and cannot end even when our bodies give out. Reborn in God. And that life does not and cannot end, even when our bodies give out. Jesus lived a beautiful life until he was about the age of Josh. Then he was killed by twisted people of our broken world. God the Father knows what it's like to lose a son. Jesus' friends and family wept and mourned and agonized in grief, such an unjust loss. Then Jesus came alive again. He interacted with family and friends and over a period of weeks was seen by hundreds of people. And finally, while meeting with his disciples, he was taken up to heaven. They watched him ascend. What would a loving God do about a tangled world of love and hate, splendor and horror, life and death? God offers us life with him now that never ends. God offers us life on this side of heaven where quite frankly there is death and mourning and crying and pain. And God offers us life on the other side in a restored realm where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain, where everything finally is set right. Isn't that what you were singing about? No more crying here. We need something more than an ideal or an idea for that to happen. We need God. The eternal God is our refuge. That's what, we, that's what Josh relied on. Sarah remembers when he was in the hospice he was whispering Jesus and I ask are you praying and he said Jesus I just like that name And Sarah says, I said, that's why the old song says there's something about that name. But we couldn't sing it because I was crying and he had no breath. So I played it. And he mouthed every word and said Jesus aloud each time. Mm -hmm. Josh showed us the way. Well, let me wrap up with this passage that's familiar with most of us. The Apostle Paul wrote it, it's easy for him to imagine But you know, it's not so hard to imagine it with someone half the Apostle Paul's age, or less, actually. Paul writes, As for me, I'm already being poured out as a libation, which is a wonderful picture. I mean, it's a type of offering the Jews made where they poured out water onto the altar. A pouring out of praise and thanksgiving and amen. And Paul's saying, that's my life. So we think of Josh. As for me, I'm being poured out as a libation, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the fate. He's been fighting with purpose and hope. The long defeat. And he's going to die. 
from now on, and Paul takes just as seriously the other side. And from now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, to all who have longed for his appearing. I'm so glad to have walked a ways with Josh. He is truly an inspiration for me. His courageous success in engaging the long defeat with purpose and hope is written on my heart. He has shown us the way. Well, let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness. Seems like a good song to sing. Words will appear on the same screen. We'll follow Josh and Christiana. Morning by morning, 
new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Yes, great is Thy faithfulness, great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Well, now it's time to hear some personal stories about Josh. We'll start with D and Dan, and mom and pop. And after that, we'll roll right into the video of Sarah, all right? And after that, and I'll say all this again, or at least the part about you, you'll have a chance to share some memories too, okay? Thank you, Chuck. That was really nice. Really appreciate all of you being here. We honor you for your sacrifice of your time, and thank you for those, too, that are watching online. The service, viewing the service, we thank you. We are so grateful to all of you who gave to us during the journey. Visits, food, money, letters, texts, these all made the journey more bearable and made us feel you were on the road with us. And now you are sharing our grief. <sighs> Joshua, our time spent with you on this earth was too short. Memories of you as a baby, a little boy, a young man, <laughs> adult and father flood my mind, but I can't share them because I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> we will continue on together, always missing you. Joshua was not a God. He was a man that relied on God and he trusted God especially during this cancer journey. He did not complain. He was interested, caring, and compassionate when he heard of someone else's illness, even during his own. I expressed my admiration for how he handled cancer and his response. It's not me, it's God. I'm just along for the ride. He said that on a couple of occasions. He said it when he was in hospice, too. Joshua relied on Sarah. Joshua purchased a necklace for Sarah when he was in Boston with Jesse with an anchor on it, because that's who she is. She's our anchor. George, Karina, and Isaac were his light. He hated being away from them. When he was required to be admitted to the hospital, 
or to be at the cancer center for treatments. Their time together was so precious to him. As we move into the future, we will honor Joshua with our love for each other. That is his legacy, love for each other. I want to end my thoughts with a letter from Joshua. This letter was written after the birth of Karina. The reason for the letter was that my feelings were hurt. I was hurt because Joshua did not tell us before Karina was born, and I had wanted to be at the hospital. You may hear some irritation in this letter. (laughs) What is said in this letter tells of the abiding love between Joshua and Sarah. Mom, thanks for coming to visit us at the hospital. We did want you there, or we wouldn't have asked you to come. We were just really tired when you guys got there, and I had no manners or patience as usual. We love you and your crazy husband. (laughs) And we're blessed to have parents, in-laws, grandparents, who love and care about us. I hope you don't resent us not asking you, or anyone else for that matter, to join us earlier. Sarah and I knew we needed each other, and only each other, to get through labor and delivery. And I won't make excuses for that, because that's just how it was. Just be glad we love each other. Like that, okay? (laughs) She and I often marvel somewhat bittersweetly, at how much we love and need each other. When we see and hear of couples who we thought were meant to be splitting up, divorcing, and breaking their vows to each other, it sucks, and I hate to see it, especially when I know birth both firsthand and from you and Dad's example that saying you'll love someone forever is not only possible to follow through on, but one of the best things that can ever happen to two people. We'll see you again soon. Love, Joshua. And I say to that, we'll see you again soon, Joshua. Most of what, most of what I'm going to say is in a song. Um, but what is there to say after what she just said? You know, that, that's it. He, uh, he could outlove people and care about someone else's pain when he's in much worse. When I hurt my shoulder, he's like, what can we do for you? And he was already deep into this. That's just how he was. Um, I have to switch to another, oh, thank you. <laughs> I thank you for inspiring an idea and a thought that would help me write a song. We were praying at Dennis's at Josh's last Thanksgiving, and Dennis prayed that, you know, hey, why don't we all just ask God to help us be Josh strong? Because just as Dee read about and everybody's been talking about today, that's how he was, leading the way, just being what he needed to be in the Lord. So I'll just go ahead, and and I borrowed the melody. If anybody knows the Allman Brothers, it's one of their melodies, so I stole that, and I'll give it back to them. Well, I'm glad somebody's got a pickup here, because I dropped mine.
Is that on? All right, thanks. Draw strong. He knew he had to go. And though it was his heavy load, we tried so hard to help him stay. Fought his battles day by day. Suddenly he's gone away. Josh Strong, oh please, please help us, Jesus. Josh Strong, you had to lead the way. For broken hearts left here to stay. A simple life. A simple, oh sorry. A simple life of tr trust and love. Ooh, sorry. Life of trust and love. Far, um, good times with you we're thinking of. Ran well your race to those above. You helped him, Jesus. Son, in the Spirit, the three in one, Jesus Christ can take us there, forever in his glory share. Lord, give us the strength to carry on, to carry on. Just from you're still helping me. And you it was so plain to see. And you it was so plain to see. Trust in him. You kept your stride He carried you, you took the ride Now forever side by side You and Jesus for coming and honoring my son. I met Josh when I was 13 in Hot Topic in the Westminster Mall. He was there with my cousin Aaron and he completely ignored me. Rude. Over time, I learned he was just shy. 
so shy, so smart, so quick-witted, and so devoted to the people he loved. He was a Colorado native, raised in Broomfield and Brighton. His parents have a picture of him as a little boy peering into his little brother's crib, figuring out who he was. He was an excited, protective brother, and he picked Jesse's middle name. He and Jesse got into all kinds of mischief together, but anyone who babysat them told their parents what lovely boys they were. And as a kid, he helped with Backyard Bible Club and was so kind to the kids in his mom's daycare. When we were teenagers, we did a lot of things that were just dumb. We've told George that we were double-dose dumb. A lot of you might remember that. Even then, there was so much more to him. He got really good grades and felt a lot of responsibility to look out for his friends. He then attended Barkley College and took people in Kansas by surprise with his mohawk lip ring, big heart, and intelligence. He made lifelong friendships. And he learned to drive a tractor. He and I, after being friends for years, were next door neighbors in college and finally officially fell in love. As the years went on, he became more selfless for the ones he loved. You could almost see it happen in phases. First, our wedding, then sitting at the bedside of his grandpa George as he died. Then the pregnancies and miscarriages and births that led to our little family. Then the tragically early deaths of some of his childhood friends, step by step. His heart for the people he loved just kept growing. I could keep these stories going all day, but you all know what an amazing father and friend he was. He was one of the good ones. And losing him feels really unfair. I need you to know that he was who he was because he loved Jesus. He was a smart, analytical, rational person, yet he believed that his heart could understand certain things that his mind could not. Things about God, life, eternity, and suffering That's why, as his health got worse and my mind swirled with what-ifs, he was able to say things like, Doctors don't decide when I die. Only God does. So let's not cry too much. We're still together today. He once texted me and said, I don't know if God will heal me. It's enough to know that he could. God is so good, Sarah. Then he was in hospice. His lungs were failing, and he prayed for his kids. He spoke the name of Jesus. I recited the lyrics to a thrice song. I won't rest until my feet touch the shore of the land that I've been searching for as long as I live, where there will be no pain or tears anymore. He gathered his breath and replied, It's true. Looking back on his illness, I know he was scared. I remember him crying at the kids' bedsides, worrying about their future without their dad. 
He wasn't ready to die. But he focused on life. He did his treatments. He made memories with us. And he made us laugh like only he could. A nurse at the hospital once told us that Josh embodied a favorite quote of hers by Wendell Berry. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Josh knew that there's more than the facts can tell us. I knew Josh for 20 years and was married to him for 11. But the last 20 months showed the depth of who he really was, who God created him to be. I love him now more than ever. That was wonderful. So uh, several of you done a really nice job of, uh, well, I really don't know if you've done a nice job, but I know you've completed some memory cards. And I've given you the benefit of the doubt that it's terrific. Just the effort is terrific. And, and I want to say, because I'm thinking there's going to be an opportunity to do a response to the YouTube thing. Is that right? Can people write in response? OK, so even if you haven't filled out a card today, when the going to be a way to view this on YouTube and you'll have a chance to respond on that. You could write something there too. Or you could write a card before you leave today. You can send an email to any of the players here. But maybe some of you are ready to share a memory or two right now. And why don't you stand up and speak aloud and rather than passing a microphone and uh, undesirables along with the microphone, just stand and share a memory. Can you? <coughs> You have one? Somebody here has something you want to share? Yeah. Wow. That's Mark Kind. You might say your name when you stand up, just in case. We're okay not sharing memories. I mean, that's why we're here. It's because we have memories. You may have noticed I have a hard time speaking at this memorial service. <laughs> I get that. I think what we'll do is we've got some more good things. So we're going to look at a video. And in this video, Brad Carpenter, Sarah and Josh's friend from Kansas days, who now lives in Rwanda, Africa, has some words for us. And then we're going to uh, oh, then we'll have uh, just some pictures, a slideshow with music. And then George is going to read for us. And George is going to read an excerpt from The Last Battle, which is C.S. Lewis' book. George came across one of my favorite quotations. And if you don't know, if you're not familiar with the Narnia Chronicles, just in brief, what's going on are there's this set of children who are having great adventures in a land through the wardrobe. Yeah, there's a whole series of books and adventures that they have. And then we get to this last book, which we really don't want to be the last book. We want there to be another one. And we're devastated because we can't believe our eyes. That they're all killed in a train accident. I mean, it just can't end that way. But it doesn't end that way. And that's what George is going to read about. So let's, let's go with that.
So today I wanted to read in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23. Um, this is a passage that the Lord brought to mind many times in praying for Josh and Sarah and the kids and um, continuing to pray this prayer over Sarah and the kids and other family uh, as well as us and other, other friends of theirs um, in this difficult time. Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Then Aslan turned to them and said, You do not yet look so happy as I mean you to be. Lucy said, We're so afraid of being sent away, Aslan, and you have sent us back into our own world so often. No fear of that, said Aslan. Have you not guessed? Their hearts leaped and a wild hope rose within them. All of you are, as you used to call them in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, 
But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Those pictures were a celebration. Good. Great reading, George. Yeah. I'll close this with prayer. You know, before I, before I do that, I just want to say how important it is to be together at a time like this. It just matters that we're in the same room. Just like it matters to you, it matters to this family. So, Lord, uh, <clears throat> a joy that burns bright in our hearts is that um, although we're sad that Josh has completed the title on the cover page, he's on to the great story, which never ends, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Thank you for that. And thank you that you are walking on the song side, every person here, every one of them. And your love falls on them like sun and rain. And that we can draw nourishment from you and we need it. Glory to your holy name. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for coming. You can take your time leaving. You can just hang around. Thank you all. Pardon me? <laughs>